So it's a pleasure to have here Gabriel Kaiser. He's uh, well, he got his PhD at University of Campinas in Brazil, and, and now he's at University of Sao Paulo at the Department of Applied Mathematics. And he's an expert on uh, mathematical optimization and especially on nonlinear optimization, which is going to be the, the topic of the course. So thank you for coming here, and all yours. Okay, thank you, Julio. Can you all hear me? Isn't it too loud here? It's okay? Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, thank you very much for attending this course. Uh, I'll talk about uh, optimality conditions, algorithms, and nonlinear optimization. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, this is a four part course. This uh, will be four days of course here. Um, the first part is an introduction to nonlinear optimization, so it should be easier to follow. Uh, I, I will start with some examples and some historical notes, um, first and second order optimality conditions, and some introduction to some algorithms. Uh, the second part will, will focus on optimality conditions, and the third part on some uh, properties of uh, optimization problems, and the last part will focus on algorithms. So uh, before I start, I should make this announcement about a conference that we are organizing in Brazil. Let me open here. So it's... Uh, Brazilian Congress of Young Researchers in Pure and Applied Mathematics. It will happen in December. Uh, interesting enough, uh, this conference is supported by the, the CIMA, Sociedade Espanhola de Matemática Aplicada, and Real Sociedade Matemática Espanhola. So, uh, this, this idea came from, from the conference that happens here in Spain. Uh, of young researchers, and we have one one member of the organizing committee that he is from UC3M, Kenia Castillo, and he's now visiting us in Brazil. So we started to to organize a similar congress uh, in Brazil, and we have 15 thematic sessions. Maybe I should mention here discrete mathematics, uh, probability and statistics, optimization, operational research, and many others. You can check here uh, the address. Um, the organizing committee, we have, uh, the scientific committee, we have Sergio Amat from Cartagena, uh, representing the Sociedade Espanhola de Matemática Aplicada, and Francisco Marcelan, representing RSME. Uh, <coughs> the the opening, opening lecture will be by Arthur Avila. He's the uh, he's 2014 Fields Medalist, and he's the first Fields Medalist that was uh, raised and educated on a developing country. So we are very proud of him. He works in, in Brazil and, and France, and he will make the opening lecture. Uh, so if, if any of you, you would like to come to the, to the conference, it will be my pleasure. So you can, you can talk to me. Um, if you, if you want to go, you can write me. Uh, for for posters, poster sessions, um, <coughs> you can submit your, your abstract until the end of this, this week. So this is mainly for master students and um, students on the beginning of the PhD, but for uh, for young professors or for students ending their PhD, you can give an oral presentation, and this uh, the registration date is passed. But you can you can talk to me, and we can arrange it. Uh, we have financial support, so. Uh, if you would like to come, please please talk to me. Okay, so going back to the course, uh, <clears throat> I should mention that you can 
download these slides at this website here. I hope you can all, you can all see. Um, <coughs> you just have to click on conference and then you can download the slides. Okay, so let's begin. Um, um, I will talk about nonlinear optimization. So optimization is a mathematical problem with many real world applications. So you have to find minimizers or maximizers of uh, a function, a real function with many variables, and you have to do this under a constrained domain. So some, some of the variables are, are important for your minimization function. So here we have two, two problems. Um, the first problem is to draw a map of America with areas proportional to the real areas. We know that uh, it's impossible to map the sphere on the plane if you want to conserve areas of the, the countries. So if uh, on, on, our, the, on our plane map, you, we, we use the Mercator projection and areas are distorted on this, um, on this projection. So uh, it's um, only a, a fun problem to try to draw a map of America with areas proportional to the real ones. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I, will, I will show you how we can formulate this problem. Another interesting problem is the hard spheres problem. So the problem is we, we have a, an n-dimensional sphere and we want to place some points on the surface of this sphere. So we, have to, we want to do this in such a way that the, the distribution is, in some sense, homogeneous. So we can do this by minimizing, um, maximizing the smallest, dis, dis, uh, the smallest distance. So we have a set of points. We, in, in any position on the sphere, you can always measure the smallest distance between a pair of points, and you want this distance to be maximized. So this is the, the problem, hard spheres problem. So we'll talk about this problem a little bit later. So uh, about this problem of uh, drawing a map of America, uh, we have here um, the usual map, and what we do here, we, we chose 132 points on this map uh, without any criteria, it's, it's just a toy problem. And <clears throat> with these points, we, we draw the, the frontiers of the, the countries. So a country now is a, is a polygon with many faces. And we have the, the, here the real areas of each country, beta j, and we, we separated America in 17 countries. They're not really countries. Here uh, we have separated continental part of uh, the United States, of the rest of it. They count as different countries. <coughs> so we have fixed these points PA bar, and we want to find new points. These are the, the PA without the bars. These are the variables of our problem. So what we want to do is to find these new points PI that are close to PI bar. So we minimize the sum of the, the squared distance, Euclidean distance, um, <clears throat> in such a way that the area of a country is preserved. So this, this formula here measures uh, the area of a polygon, if you have all, all its vertices. It's the green, green Gauss formula to compute areas. You change a uh, double integral of area as the integral on, on, this, on the contour of the polygon. So every point pi has a x coordinate and a y coordinate and then if you compute this and you sum this for every point that defines the, the country, this should be j. So this is the, uh, the points pi 
should, should satisfy this constraint. Okay? If you don't understand anything, please raise your hand and uh, we can discuss it a little bit further. <coughs> so here, this is the problem. Um, we want to minimize this. Um, this is the solution. This is the usual map. We see here that uh, on the usual map, the continental part of the United States is 5% less than the area of Brazil. But if you look at the usual map, the continental part of the United States is 30% larger than Brazil, which is not true. So uh, this is the, the map with proportional areas. Um, this may be a, a fun way to represent the areas of the countries. So once we do this, we can uh, solve a similar problem, but changing this value beta j by other, other numbers. So here we have beta j are proportional to the population of the countries. So we have here a, 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 here a map of America with areas proportional to population. So we see Latin America is much larger and Canada disappears. So we can do this also for GDP, the gross income, the richness of the country, and then Latin America is very thin, North America is huge. Okay, this is just a toy problem. I don't know if this could be useful, but it's interesting to show information in this way. So about the, the hard spheres problem, um, as I mentioned before, the hard spheres problem consists of, oops, of maximizing the smallest distance d between uh, endpoints on the n-dimensional sphere, uh, between m, uh, a pair of points in, selected by these uh, endpoints on the on the sphere. And this problem is related to the kissing number of a given dimension. So the kissing number of a dimension n is the largest number of unit spheres that you can that you can put touching another unit sphere. So here in R2 we have a, a fixed two-dimensional sphere and I want to know how many other unit spheres I can put around this, this fixed one. Um, the largest number of, of spheres that can be put touching these other given spheres. So in, this is the kissing number of the dimension. So we know this for dimension two is six, and we know this for dimension three, it's, it's this configuration here. Uh, this is a very difficult problem. Um, Newton and Gregory, they had a, a dispute about the solution of this problem for dimension three. We know now that you can put only 12 spheres around, around a given sphere, but we, we see that this D star, it's the, uh, the largest distance between two spheres, this is 2.1. So if, if we, we can move this configuration and you have another, another configuration of points. In two dimension, this is tight. You can't move uh, one single sphere without overlapping. So in, in three dimensions, this is not true. You, can, you, can, you have a little bit of, of space to move it, and, but you, you, you can't move it enough to fit a, a, a new sphere. So Newton and Gregory, they had a dispute uh, in 1500, and Newton thought it was 12, and Gregory thought it was 13. But this was proved only in 1950s that Newton was correct. You, you, in fact, you have only, you can only put 12 spheres. So we see that <coughs> What's the, the relation between these two problems? It's the following. So you can try to, to find the kissing number of R2 by 
trying to, to place the centers of these six spheres on the surface of, uh, of this sphere here, the sphere that contains this, all the centers. So it's uh, spheres of radius two, the, the, the red sphere has radius one, and you can look at the sphere of radius two and try to place the M centers of these spheres on the surface of this radius two sphere. So if you can solve this optimization problem, and if the distance, if you can, if, if you can place the centers and such that the smallest distance uh, is two, and when, when you maximize the smallest distance, it, the solution is greater than two, this means that you can place a sphere at this point and it will not touch the other ones. So this gives um, a lower bound for the kissing number. If you can place M spheres with the distance greater than two, then the kissing number is greater than this. So you, with optimization, you can have lower bounds for this difficult problem of uh, kissing numbers. Okay, and we, we don't know the kissing numbers of dimension five, six, seven. So it's really a difficult problem. But with optimization, you can have these lower bounds. Uh, another interesting application of optimization is on packing problems. So uh, you have a, a, a sphere here, a two-dimensional sphere, and you want to put some small spheres inside of it. So you, can, you want to put the, the largest number of spheres inside this, this other one. So here we can put uh, seven spheres, and you can pack uh, many more complicated uh, containers. So we have here a triangular container, we want to pack it with spheres. We have a three-dimensional uh, triangle, you want to pack it with spheres. Or you can have this uh, circular session, uh, you want to pack it with rectangles. So in, in this situation, you want to pack it with rectangles, but there are only two possible positions of a rectangle. Uh, it can be a, a vertical rectangle or a horizontal, horizontal one. So you can solve this, but here it's a more complicated uh, problem. Um, the rectangles, may, well, they, you have to fit it inside the intersection of two parabolas, and you can rotate it, the, the rectangles, with any angle. So we can solve this with nonlinear optimization. And this problem of uh, packing, um, this has been used in a real-world application in molecular dynamics. So the idea here is that um, chemical engineers, they want to simulate um, how some molecules will interact. So they want to, to place two molecules on the computer and they want to see how, how they react. And to, to introduce the, this molecule on the, on the computer, you can't do this in such a way that the molecules are superimposed. If you do this, the, the simulation does not run correctly. So you want to find a, an, an initial configuration of molecules uh, in such a way that this, this energy is not too large. So if, if two molecules are, are too close to each other, um, the energy is uh, intense and very large, and the simulation won't work. So we want to, to pack uh, on, a, on a given container, you want to put two molecules such that they are uh, homogeneously distributed around this, this, this area. So it's, it's a packing, packing problem. So, uh, our group in Brazil, they, they formulated this problem as a molecule packing problem, and this has been used for uh, chemical engineers, and these are some, some patterns. Uh, so, in this kind of problems, you, you may have a very, a very large number of variables and a very large number of constraints, 
And this is the, the, the record of uh, largest nonlinear problem that was solved. It's a problem on finance. I will, I will show some details of optimization problems in finance on, on the last day. So, but um, this problem is a quadratic convex problem with 353 million constraints and 1 billion variables. So this was solved in 2005 using an interior point method. And the, the interior point method by Gonzi. So I will show at the end of this, this lecture uh, a brief introduction of interior point methods. But if you want to know more, you can search for Gonzi's work. He has a very interesting works on interior point methods. Uh, one I would like to mention is a paper from uh, electronic journal, European Journal of Operations Research. Uh, it's called uh, Interior Point Methods 25 Years Later. So it's a state of the art interior point methods. <clears throat> and another large scale problem is a localization problem. So here we want to place uh, want to find a point. This point must lie in the interior of a rectangle and in the exterior of an ellipsis. So it's this non-convex area here. So we want to, to find this point that um, minimizes the, the distance to these polygons. So uh, you have this point and this polygon, you can measure this distance and you want the point to be located in a place that minimizes all the distance. So this is a difficult, non-convex problem, and we, in our group in Brazil, we solved this with an augmented Lagrangian method, and I will talk about this method in more details. So here we have 1.5 million polygons, 3 million variables, and 14 million constraints, uh, the algorithm divides the constraints in hard constraints and, and easy constraints. And then we have here 10 iterations and we, 133 function evaluations and we solve this in 185 seconds. So we see that, that this technique uh, can be applied quite effectively. So, uh, our group in Brazil, in uh, University of Sao Paulo and University of Campinas, we have a, a solver for um, nonlinear optimization that uses this, this augmented Lagrangian method. So, you can download it from my website or directly at the Tango website. So, here, just I would like to show you. Um, some statistics of this solver. So it has had 40,000 visits in, from many places around the world. In particular, in Spain, we have here some visits from, from Madrid, Barcelona, Valencia, Murcia, and someone here in Santiago also visited this, this page. So I hope we can increase this number after this course. Okay, so uh, I want to mention some historical notes on, on the optimization problem. And this started, uh, the optimization started uh, in uh, military programs in the United States. So the, the difficult part of an optimization problem is that the, the constraints, they are formulated using inequalities. If you have equalities, it's a, a little bit easier, but usually we have inequality constraints, and, and this is the, they didn't know how to, how to deal with this. So in, in 1948, Danzig from Stanford, uh, he introduced this paper, Programming in a Linear Structure, where he invented the simplex method to solve this problem. So uh, the term linear programming present, uh, appeared here in, by Koopmans. 
And um, <coughs> Dorfman, a little bit later, he thought that linear programming was too restrictive, and he suggested this name, mathematical programming, that we now call mathematical optimization. Uh, Nonlinear programming appeared a little, uh, some two or three years later, on this paper by Kuhn and Tucker, where they introduce optimality conditions for these problems. So this is a generalization of the Lagrange rule of multipliers for the case of equality and inequality constraints. So uh, I want to focus on on Kuhn Tucker work showing these optimality conditions. And the important thing about these conditions is that uh, they suggest an algorithm to solve this problem. Uh, so and, and this linear programming uh, problem is, um, is, a, is a re revolutionary in the sense that we can now formulate an objective and try to solve, try to determine a way to, to, to reach this, this objective in the best way possible. So the tools to, to do this is, is these four steps. You have to model your optimization, your real life problem using, uh, model it on a mathematical language. Then you, have, you need to have uh, an algorithm to have an idea to solve this, and you have to, to implement this in a computer. So you have to have computers and softwares that implement these algorithms. And uh, the theory of linear programming or nonlinear programming, it, uh, it appeared only on, in 1947. And the reason for this is that we didn't have computers back then. So uh, it, it, it had no point in developing theory for this problem if you couldn't actually solve it on a computer. So uh, since then it introduced the simplex, we, we now um, have uh, the algorithm and the available com computers to solve it. And uh, some important topics in, in optimization is to deal with sparsity. So many, many real world problems, you can have a million or billion of variables and constraints, but maybe you have many, many zeros, many, many zeros on, on, on the formulation of these, these constraints. So maybe you have a, um, a linear constraint some A matrix times the var variable X should be equal to another vector B. S but, but this matrix A, this typically it has many zeros. So if you want to implement a product A times X, you want to, to explore this structure of zeros in the matrix A. So this is the sparsity of the problem and you have to be able to explore this, this sparsity if you want to solve larger problems. Another important um, aspect of optimization is global optimization. In fact, in many real world applications, you want the, the global minimizer, that is the, the a given point that returns the, the minimum of this function with respect to all the other feasible points. This is a, a global solution. But uh, algorithms typically can only find local solutions. That is, if you look in a neighborhood of this point, then th this is the, the minimizer. But you don't have guarantees that this will be the solution if you look at a point far away from this given point. So since our algorithms, they take use of derivatives, and derivatives only give you local information, so we are uh, our, our algorithms only deal with local optimization. So, but if you want to solve real, real life problems, you, you want to deal with global optimization. So you have to maybe solve your optimization problem many times using different initial points. This way you can reach the global, global optimization. And another important aspect is automatic differentiation. So you have a function that represents 
your objective function and your constraints. This may be very complicated, and, but you have a way to, to compute its derivatives automatically. So this is not an approximation. It's, you can automatically compute the real derivatives. So there are some software that can do this. So you, you input the code of your function, and the algorithm returns another code that computes the derivatives on a given point. So this is very interesting, and uh, you should be able to, to use this, this kind of software if you want to solve a real-life problem. So I want to give you just an idea of how this automatic differentiation works. So if you want, I want to compute the derivative of this function, what the, this automatic differentiation software does, it separates the function on this tree. So here on, on, this, on this, uh, this node, you have uh, the simplest element, that is x1, and this is x2. And you compute the derivative here on each node. So I input the value of x1, it's pi, and x2 is 3. So I compute here the derivatives of this function x1 with respect to x1 and x2 are the variables. So this is the, the derivative of this function, and this is the derivative of x2. So in this node, we have the product of these two other nodes. So the value is 3 pi, and you can compute here the derivative using the product rule of derivatives. So you, you, you mix, uh, you multiply x2 times the derivative of x1, and you add this to x1 times the derivative of x2, and you have this, this, this value. Here you have another node that computes the sign of this node. So this node, the value is pi, so x3, the value of sign of pi is zero, and you have a rule to define the, the derivative of this node. And here then you, you add these two values, you have the, the value of the function, it's 3 pi, and you have the value of the derivative that you compute by adding these this two derivatives. So it's something like that. You can compute, uh, having these, these rules, you can compute the derivative of any function. Okay, uh, another important aspect of optimization is the duality theory. So uh, the duality theory, it, um, maybe I, I should start by the end here. Uh, it has these this elements. You have a pair of optimization problems. So you have uh, your initial problem is the primal problem. You have to minimize some function uh, age. And you want to, to construct the dual of this problem. So the dual is typically a problem of maximization, and it's based on the same data of the original problem. So you want to minimize this function h, and you want to make, maximize this function f, and these are all built with the same data. So an, an important aspect is um, if you have a feasible point for the minimization problem, and a feasible point for the maximization problem, you will always have this kind of inequality. So you want to maximize f and minimize h, but these are all always uh, separated. H are, eight, feasible h are always above feasible f. So um, if, you have, if you want to minimize h, and if you can find a feasible point for the dual problem, you have a lower bound for the solution of your original problem, because it will be below all the val values of h for any feasible point. So uh, this, is an, uh, this is important to give lower bounds for solutions, but you can always also use this to solve the problem. So typically, if you have two feasible points for the minimization and for the maximization problem, such that the, the, the function values are the same, 
these are typically the solution for the problem. So we want to maximize F, minimize H, and when they coincide, you have the solution. Okay, so uh, I will show you one example of duality. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the development of duality came from game theory. So um, Danzig was developing the simplex method in, in Princeton, and von Neumann was this uh, renowned um, game theorist. And <clears throat> since uh, the American military was interested in in, in linear programming, they invested a lot of money on it. So uh, von Neumann came to visit Danzig in Princeton, and they came up with this duality theory. So uh, von, they, uh, von Neumann started to uh, he distributed some some notes on, on their results in in, in Princeton, but there, there was a mistake. So Gail, Kahn, and Tucker, um, they, they fixed this, this mistake and they, pu they published their results on duality uh, in this paper of 1951. And von Neumann, 12 years later, he published uh, his work based on, 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 on the notes that he was circulating. So Kahn and Tucker was uh, the same one that developed the optimality conditions that uh, I will talk about later. And, but for this problem in, in duality, the uh, Gale also helped them. So uh, you can trace duality back from the 17th century uh, by this, this problem by Fermat. So this problem, we have three points. P1, P2, and P3 on the plane. And we want to find a point X that minimizes the sum of the distance from X to the vertices of this triangle. So uh, if, you, you, if you take X as the center of mass of this triangle, you have this value, 2.895. But surprisingly, this is not the solution. The solution is, is this other point. With, uh, it's a little bit smaller distance. In fact, if you add squares here to the sum, so if you minimize the sum of the squares, then you have the, the center of mass. But if you want to minimize the actual sum of the distance, then you have this other point. You see, it's, this is a little bit difficult problem because uh, if you want to measure the Euclidean distance, you have a square root, and the square root doesn't, doesn't have derivatives in every point. So square root of zero, you, you can't compute the derivative. So this complicates the optimization problem. So this is why we add squares sometimes to simplify the problem. But if you want to really find the solution here of this non-differentiable problem, uh, you can solve it using duality. So um, there is this seemingly unrelated problem. You have this same triangle. Uh, this is formulated in, in, this, in this paper. Uh, you have a triangle with, with sides 10, 12, and 16. And you want to find uh, a field with largest area, you, um, equiangular field that contains these three points with the largest area. So you, you, want, you want to find the, the largest equi, equiangular or equilateral triangle that contains these three points. So we see if we start here at this green triangle, it contains all the three points on their sides, but it has a small area. So if we rotate the triangle a little bit, you can increase the area, and this is the solution. This, this black triangle here, equi equilateral triangle. And we see here how the areas vary with the color. 
So at the solution, uh, we see here first that, uh, okay, you, the, you want to maximize the area, so this is uh, increasing function. And at the solution, this is exactly the value of the solution of the previous problem, 2.866. Okay, so if you, you solve this problem, you have this triangle, and you can now build the solution to the first problem. You simply compute here uh, perpendiculars to this, this point here, and when then these perpendiculars meet, they find a point X, and this X is the solution of the previous problem. So in, in this edition of this uh, journal, this duality concept was recognized, and this is the, the first, first time uh, duality was used to solve a problem. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let me give you some examples uh, of optimization problems, and of uh, the optimality conditions that we want to study. So he here, here is the formal definition of the optimization problem. We have f, the so-called objective function. It has n real value entries, so the variables, we have n, n variables, and it returns a real value. So we, 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 have, we want to find which vector x gives the, the minimum value uh, of f of x. And this is the constraints. This defines which x are feasible. So these are also real value functions. And typically we have equality and inequality constraints. So x must be such that age i of x is zero for m such functions age. And G, gj should be, at x, should be less or equal to zero for p such functions. Um, and we, we will assume that these functions are continuously differentiable. So if we assume first order continuously differentiable function, we have first order optimality conditions. But if we assume twice continuously differentiability, we can build a second order uh, optimality condition that are better, and we can also build sufficient conditions for optimality. <clears throat> and this we call omega, this feasible set. So the, the, the points x that satisfies all the constraints. So this is our, the, our, our feasible point x. And so what we want to find is a global solution. It's a, a feasible point x star that belongs to the feasible set omega. This will be called a global minimizer of this nonlinear pro programming problem when f evaluated at x star is less or equal to f of x for every other feasible point x in omega. So this is uh, the difficult problem of finding a global solution, but we can solve this by a, a sequence of local minimization. So uh, a local solution will be a feasible point x star in omega, such that there is some neighborhood uh, of x star, of radius epsilon, such that f of x star is less or equal f of x, for every feasible x inside this neighborhood. So a local solution, x star will be called a, so a local solution if you can find such positive epsilon. And uh, just introducing some more notation, we call this A of x, it's the set of indexes of inequality constraints. So remember we had P inequality constraints, gj of x less or equal to zero, but at a feasible point x, some inequality constraints may be active. So uh, they, they are satisfied as equalities. So this set of indexes, we call it 
this, the set of active inequality constraints at a uh, feasible point, at any feasible point x. So uh, we, will, we will see that um, this set of indexes are, are the ones that uh, you can use to characterize a solution. So the, if, you, if you only look locally, the inactive constraints, they are not important. So because if you have a, a point, uh, maybe I, I, I can draw here. If you have a point x where some constraint gj of x is inactive, so this is less than zero. So since this function j is continuous, you can, you can perturb this point x. So you can add here some vector d. And this will remain less than zero as long as this d is small enough. Okay? If this, um, if gj of x is less than zero and you, you add to x uh, a small vector of any direction but small enough, then this, this will hold. Okay, this is because of continuity of the function j. So, um, if you have a, uh, on a solution, you have an inactive constraint, you can, you, can, you can remove this constraint from your problem, and this point will remain a solution of the problem. Okay, because if you, you walk in any direction, you will have uh, visibility for this constraint. I will, I will show some examples later. Okay. So his, here is a first example with uh, two variables and one inequality constraint. So I want to minimize this function x square plus y square subject to this line, x plus y minus one equals to zero. So uh, here are the level sets of the objective functions. So along this, this line, x squared plus y squared is, returns the same value, okay? So I want to find the, a point x, y that lies along this line, that is a feasible point, such that um, it has the, it lies on the, the smallest level set. So we can see here that this solution is here, okay, at the point one half, one half. This is the, you can think of it as the darkest point that lies along this red line. So the darkest point must be somewhere around here, okay? Okay, so uh, we can study this point half half um, using Lagrange multipliers. So uh, the theory of Lagrange multipliers says that uh, something like that. Let me draw here. So at at a solution x star, if you have one inequality constraints, I mean, if you have many inequality constraints, h of x equals to zero for some m constraints, um, the Lagrange theorem says that there exists some vector of Lagrange multipliers some real numbers, m real numbers, such that if you compute the gradient of f 
at x star and you, you add here a linear combination of this vector gradient of h at x stars and, and lambdas, they appear here this will be zero. Okay, so, so this, is, this is the Lagrange multiplier theorem. So for this to happen, we, it's not in, in every problem that this, this happens. Um, okay, we, we'll get in, in these details a little bit later, but for some conditions on the function's age, you 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 always you are always able to find these Lagrange multipliers. So if you have only one constraint, this is what we have: the gradient of the objective function, that is 2x to y, this vector, at the point half half. It's this vector of ones. So this is the gradient of the objective function at this point. You, in, and here you have the gradient of the constraints, that they are always 1, 1, if you compute derivatives here. So the theorem says that you, you are always able to find this Lagrange multiplier, the, in this case it's this real number minus 1, such that this combination of vectors is equal to 0. So with one constraint, the, the gradient of the objective function is parallel to the, the gradient of the constraint. This is what, what is, if you draw here this vector, you have some, some vector here that will be the gradient of the function and this will be parallel to the gradient of the constraint. If you have uh, inequality constraints, so here we want to maximize now this function, x squared plus y squared. So we want, uh, I reverse the colors of the level set, so we still want the darkest point. But now it lies inside this rectangle. So we have here this red line that says that uh, the feasible points are the ones below this red line, and but I, I'm constrained to the the first or tenth, positive or tenth. So x should be positive and y should be positive. So we define here uh, this triangle of uh, this is the feasible set. And now we see the solution is here. Okay, this is the darkest point inside the feasible set. So it's the point two zero. Uh, so, uh, but here we have this other point, zero, one, and this is a local solution. This is not the darkest point in the whole feasible set, but if you, we look here in a neighborhood of this point, these, these vertices will be the darkest one. We have the, the largest value of the, the objective function. So we have here a local solution, 0, 1, and we have here a global solution, 2, 0. And we can, we can start looking at the Lagrange multipliers. So uh, <coughs> the, the theorem of uh, Lagrange multipliers for this case is it's very similar. So let's look here at the global solution, 2, 0 the gradient of the objective, objective function is this one. So now I, I transform the, the problem a little bit. So here we had a maximization problem with less or equal to zero constraints and greater or, or equal to zero constraints. So I transform this with this, um, uh, this form. Every inequality constraint are less or equal as I formulated in the beginning. So we can do this simply by multiplying by minus one each greater or equal to zero constraint. And the objective function was to maximize something. 
if I want to, to transform it to a minimization problem, I simply minimize minus this function. It's equivalent. So every problem of maximization, you can transform it to a minimization problem with this way. And the constraints, you can always think of less or equal to zero. Uh, you can always do this trick. So if I look here at the objective function, at this point to zero, you have this vector. And now we see that um, if I want to, to compute some characteristics of this point, uh, we, I won't use informations of this constraint. This is uh, x greater or equal to zero. Okay, because uh, it, it won't play any role here because I'm looking only locally around this point. So this is because um, this is why this set of active constraints are important. I will only look at the active constraints at this point to zero. That is this one, the red constraint is active here and the constraint y greater or equal to zero are active. This is active here too. So I will, uh, the result is the same. The, main, the gradient of the function is a linear combination of these active constraints. But you can, you, if, since we have um, uh, inequality constraints, you can, you can always show that this Lagrange multiplier will be non-negative. So um, this is the only difference if you want the optimality conditions of an inequality constraint problem comparing with equality constraint problems. So uh, the Lagrange multipliers are always non-negative. And if you have a combination of constraints, equality and inequality constraints, the Lagrange multipliers for equality constraints will be unconstrained, but for the inequality constraints, they, they are always non-negative. So here we can, we can check that uh, this condition, this optimality condition is satisfied here, and also at the local solution. So this optimality condition are, are only local, so it, it can't uh, distinguish a global solution from a local solution, but it gives all the possible candidates for a local solution. So the local solutions should be such that uh, the gradient of the function should be a linear combination of the gradients of the active constraints with non-negative multipliers. So you can, you can enumerate all the possibilities, all the solutions of this system, and you can check for the objective function value. So if you want a global solution, you take this point that satisfies this condition with less, the less, less value of the objective function. Uh, here we have some, um, some other point that it, it fulfills this optimality condition, but it's not a minimizer, not even a local minimizer. So it's this point here, x equal to zero. Uh, no, here, 0 0.4 and 0 0.8. So it's something around here. <coughs> um, so this is where this level set is tangent to the line. Okay, so if if we increase the radius of, the, of this circumference, in some point it will be tangent to the constraint line here. So at this point, we have um, this optimality condition is fulfilled. You have the gradient of the objective function. It's this value zero minus two, minus two, something like here, and you will have. Um, no, it's here. I'm looking at the wrong point. Here, this point, 0, 8, minus 1.6. This is the vector of the, the gradient of f. But we see that it is parallel to the gradient of the only active constraint, that is the red line. So here, we have a situation similar to the previous example. 
So we have um, the gradient of f is parallel to the gradient of the constraint, and the sign of the Lagrange multiplier is non-negative. So uh, it is a candidate for a solution. So um, if you want, to, when we develop um, optimality conditions, we will frequently uh, have these points that are not solutions, but they fulfill our optimality conditions. So a point that fulfills this optimality condition is a point that we call a stationary point. So the situation is similar when we have a non-constrained, unconstrained minimization problem. Uh, if you have a solution for a, a problem of minimize f, and you can put any vector x there, uh, at a solution you have the gradient of the objective function to be zero. So this is so gradient zero gradient is a necessary condition for optimality, but it's not a sufficient condition. So you can have maximizers; they also fulfill this condition, and in this case, the maximizer is zero zero, and you can see that it it is also a stationary point of this problem. Uh, but you have these saddle point problems that at saddle point points. Saddle points that uh, fulfills this stationarity condition, but they are not minimizers nor maximizers. In fact, at this point, if I walk um, inside the feasible set, so if I walk around this direction, we see that the objective function value um, increases. Okay, so this point here has a greater value of, of, the optima, of the objective function, but if I walk along the red line, it decreases. So this can't be a local solution. It increases for the, at this direction, but along this red line, the objective function decreases. So it, it's, in fact, a, a saddle point problem. So um, at this point, uh, if, if we use second order information, we can in fact get rid of this point. So we, I will show you how we get rid of this point uh, using uh, information of the second derivatives. So th this, these are the first order optimality condition. This is the statement of the general theorem for minimizing f subject to equality constraint h and inequality constraints j. So under some condition that we call constraint qualification, and this will be the topic of some, some, some later, later lecture. And if we have a local solution x star, we can prove that there exists Lagrange multipliers, so we, we also call this Lagrange multipliers, lambda associated to, so it's a vector of Lagrange multipliers lambda associated to each equality constraints. Remember we had h of i equal, h of i of x equal to zero for i ranging from one to m. So from, for each inequality, for each equality constraint, we have a Lagrange multiplier and we can form a vector of Lagrange multiplier in this way, call it lambda. And you have a Lagrange multiplier mu associated to every inequality constraint that goes from one to p that uh, you can put here. And this is call, called the Lagrange condition. So, um, You can define the Lagrangian function something like that. It's f of x plus lambda i h i of x plus j g j of x. So we see that <coughs> Um, if you have a solution, x star, 
there exist some Lagrange multipliers lambda and mu, such that the gradient of the Lagrangian at x star, if you use these multipliers, this will be zero. The gradient here with respect to x. So uh, for constraint optimization, you can, you can think of uh, this condition of the gradient of the objective function is zero. It's translated to the gradient of the Lagrangian function is zero if you use appropriate uh, multipliers here, lambda and mu. So, uh, so this is the Lagrange condition, the gradient of the Lagrangian should be zero. And this is an important condition called complementarity. So this says that if at the solution x star some inequality gj is inactive, so if gj of x, of x star is strictly less than zero, then the multiplier associated to this constraint should be zero. So in this sense, you, you won't add here uh, a term corresponding to the gradient of the constraint gj, because the, this, this constraint is inactive. So you can state this by saying that this con the gradient of uh, the Lagrange condition holds, and you can add here everybody, but complementarity should hold. So if the constraint is inactive, the multiplier should be zero. Another way to, to write this is the following. You can say that the gradient of f at x star plus this term plus this one This is zero. Here we add all equality constraints, but here we add only the active constraints. So J belongs to the active set of X star. So you can replace complementarity by writing the Lagrange condition in this way. So we do this sometimes. Um, <coughs> X star should be feasible, of course. All the constraints should be fulfilled. And the, the sign of the multipliers associated to the inequality constraints should be non-negative. So this is called the dual feasibility. And um, so we, we will prove this theorem in the next lecture. Um, but just to, to give you uh, an interpretation of this condition, what we have is this. Uh, up to first order, a feasible direction cannot be a decent direction for the objective function. So let me try to explain this here. So I have here a constraint in Rn this set says that Hi of x is equal to zero. So if, if x is uh, two-dimensional, um, this is the level curve of this function H on the level zero. So this is uh, H of x equals to zero gives you this curve here. So all x along this curve has value H of x equals to zero. And uh, if, I'm at, if I'm at this point x here, and I want to maintain feasibility, I should walk along this, this curved arc here. But I, I can approximate this by this tangent line here. So this is, I want to walk along a direction d, so I'm at this point x, and I want, I want to add some direction d, and I, I can approximate this by the tangent line. 
So this will be h i of x plus the gradient of h i x transpose d. This is the first order Taylor approximation of this function. So we ha you have some error terms here, but if I'm, uh, I want to, uh, so, so at this point, this is zero, okay? X, I started as X to be a feasible point. So if I want this to be zero also, so I, wa I want to add a direction D such that this is zero, what I have here that is that this should be zero also. Okay, so um, at this point x, the gradient of h i is some vector here. It's al always orthogonal to the curve. So um, the level curve is always orthogonal to the gradient. And the direction must be perpendicular to the gradient of h. So if I want to maintain feasibility at uh, first order, I should walk along the tangent line. So the, the direction d should be orthogonal to the gradient. And if I have, um, if I have an inequality constraint, g, j. And I want to, this to be less or equal to zero. So this, this new point x plus d should be feasible. And I start at a point gj where this constraint is active. If I started at a, at a constraint, if I looked at a constraint that uh, I have some other terms here. If I looked at a, at a constraint that is not active, I, ha I argued before that you can walk in any direction and you will remain at, at a feasible point. But if you are at a point where this constraint is active, uh, you can do this same approximation. And so this should be less or equal to zero. Okay, so I have now the constraints gj of x less or equal to zero. So it gives me this uh, constraint set. This is the gradient. And the feasible directions are directions that uh, if I compute the gradient of gj here with the direction, this, um, this inner product should be less than or equal to zero. So in other words, the cosine of this angle should be negative. So it must, must have, a, the angle should be greater than 90 degrees. So these are the, the feasible directions. Okay? <clears throat> so, um, if I am at a, at, a, at a solution x star, so if x star is a solution, and if I take a feasible direction, so a vector d in Rn is first order feasible direction. And by this, I mean that the gradient of every equality constraint. If I compute the inner product with D, this should be zero for every, every equality constraint and the gradient of gj of x star transpose d 
is less than or equal to zero for every j in the active set of constraints of x star. So if this happens, so let's see what, what I get uh, using the KKT conditions, the first order optimality conditions, somewhere around here. So I know that this is zero. So if I compute inner product with this direction d, so I will multiply this by d, and this by d, okay? So at this right-hand side, I get zero, and at the right, at the left-hand side, I can distribute this d at all these terms, so let me go back here, and what I have, in fact, is this. Gradient of F transpose D, gradient of H transpose D, gradient of GJ transpose D. So this is zero, okay? So I'm, I'm choosing a, a feasible direction and I want to see what happens here. So here, this is zero, okay? So this term disappears and this since I'm adding here at the active constraints, this should be less or equal to zero. And remember the dual feasibility that the, in the sign of the Lagrange multiplier is non-negative. So the conclusion here is that the gradient of F, X star transpose D, should be greater or equal to zero, okay? So if I have a, a feasible direction and I look only to first order information, uh, the function f will increase, okay? So I have, I can do this same approximation, f of x plus d is f of x plus the gradient of f. Let me put x star here. Transpose d. So, um, I, so if I, if I walk along a direction d that goes, uh, at least in first order, it goes to inside the, the feasible set, I have argued that this is greater or equal to zero. That is, the, the objective function increases. Okay, so this term, it's the, uh, so th this, this is equally, uh, this is approximately equal, so this is will be the, the objective function will increase. So, in fact, this point x star is a minimum. Okay, if you have a minimum, uh, we prove that KKT condition holds. And this KKT condition is saying essentially this property, that if I have a, a feasible direction, the objective function will increase along this feasible direction. So, uh, this is, in fact, this is, this is equivalent. Uh, you can prove both, both sides. KKT condition is equivalent to non-increasing first order optimal, first order uh, feasible direction. <clears throat> okay, so I, I, I want to give you just, um, just, uh, just a glimpse at the second order optimality condition. Excuse me one second. Do you want to make a quick break now? Do you think it's a good moment? Mm, uh, to make a break? Okay, yeah. Okay. In 10 minutos seguimos.